And before we dive into the signs of the times, are there any questions on the sermon this morning? Patty. I just would like you to clarify um, which, Chris, uh, which scripture is the right scripture. And by because there's so many versions and, and I just... I yeah. Don't know. Okay. Been for me. Right. right. So Patty's question is, what scripture is the right scripture? And just to rephrase the question, what you're meaning, as I understand, is what Bible translation in English is the right one? Because we can have German scriptures and French scriptures. And um, yeah, so that actually opens up, in a sense, like a can of worms. Because it gets really complicated. So. What is inspired is the Word of God. That's the simple answer. Genesis to Revelation. This word is inspired. Um, but it's also been translated, right? So it was inspired in the original Hebrew and the original Greek and Aramaic, uh, a few verses. And so we have translations. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, Patty's question is what's the best Bible translation? And we in the Reformed tradition are going to say the best Bible translation is going to be the one that's most faithful to the Greek and the Hebrew manuscripts. So we have, I have a Greek Bible and an English uh, uh, Hebrew Bible on my desk, and when I write sermons, we go back to that. And so there's actually like a second can of worms there if you want to open it up for a second, is what manuscripts are being translated, because we have different Greek manuscripts that the Bible was translated. So I don't want to go there this morning, but what I would say to the short answer to your question is find a Bible translation that is closest to the original languages. But you're like, well, how do I know that, right? So that's when you just kind of have to, well, you can do some research for yourself. But otherwise, um, I'll just tell you, uh, there, <laughs> I don't know how else to say it. Um, there are, the ESV is a very good translation, the NASB, New American Standard Bible is a really good translation. Uh, the King, <clears throat> King James, New King James, these are really good, solid translations. Um, John has done a lot of study on this. I don't know, John, you might have one or two to add. <clears throat> and the CSB, is that, what is that? Christian Standard Bible. Yeah, okay. CSB. Uh, otherwise, like, so Eugene Peterson came out with a translation year, uh, years ago called The Message. Uh, even the NIV, you know, in the Dutch Reformed tradition, people use the NIV for quite a while. It's okay. But um, we're actually, in the sheriff's breakfast that I go to, we were talking about this question. So in Bible, we'll make this short, but there's a basically a science of Bible translation. And theologians debate, do you want something that's very wooden, which would be really strictly close to the text, or do you want something that just kind of gets the idea across, which is called dynamic equivalence? So the NIV, the Message, the Living Bible, they're all going to be over here on dynamic equivalence, just a loose, looser translation. But I don't think that's helpful uh, because you lose something. And there's a a tipping point where you go from translation to interpretation. And so if you stick more with a wooden literal translation, uh, the argument by the NIV Living Bible message crowd is like, well, then it's just it doesn't flow, it doesn't read like natural English. But our response would be, yeah, but we actually then are actually reading what was written, what was trans, you know, what was inspired. Um, and actually, if you've read the ESV, even the the New King James is a great update of the King James. I find them very readable. I don't find it convoluted. So, yeah. Less. Yeah, that's another can of worms. Yeah, Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, and Apocrypha. Apocrypha is like a separate thing because the early church would read and quote the Apocrypha. 
but it wasn't recognized as scripture. Even some of the Apocrypha actually say that they aren't scripture. So I think, John, you did your thing was on the Apocrypha, right? Canon. We did discuss it. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So John's kind of been putting something together we hope to put on the website on this topic of the Apocrypha. Uh, so in our, even in the Belgic Confession, we say the Apocrypha can be read, it can be profited from, but it's not scripture. And, and the early church, even though they read it and, and quoted it, um, some of the Apocrypha is really outlandish, but some of it is just history. The Maccabees, first and second Maccabees, it's just, it chronicles history in the intertestamental period between uh, Malachi, basically, and Jesus' return. So that can be very profitable. If you've never read first and second Maccabees, read it. It's, it's actually quite interesting, and it's history. Um, but so the Catholic Church will believe that the Apocrypha is scripture, that's the difference, whereas the Protestants say, no, this is not scripture. And uh, there were some reasons theologically why the Catholic Church felt it necessary to say that the Apocrypha was scripture. Uh, one of the big reasons was they felt that it taught purgatory, which is what the reformers were saying, there's no such thing. And they're like, oh, well, this scripture now is scripture. And uh, so there's some of that, but... Um, Book of Mormon and Jehovah's Witnesses are a little bit different and, in a sense, an easier thing to answer. And it gets into another conversation of what John was referring to as the canon. The canon is canon means rule or standard. And so the question we need to ask is, Genesis Revelation, is this the only standard canon of revelation, or is there other revelation out there that has been written down for us? like the Book of Mormon, the Pearl of Great Price, Doctrine and Covenants, uh, the JWs, um, what do they have, their watchtower or something? I don't know if it's inspired. You're right, because when you argue with the JW, they're saying, well, your translation is defective, you've got to read our translation. So you can get really lost in the weeds there, but to make it just real short so we can uh, Go ahead, and this is this is okay, but we could, and maybe we would do this, uh, but spend a, a Sunday teaching on the canon and why the canon is closed. And the short answer is is that in the Old and New Testament, God gave messengers of His covenant who wrote about redemptive events, and so we would have creation. We would have e Israel coming out of Egypt. That's a major redemptive event. The call of Abraham is a major redemptive event. And those events are recorded by God's appointed messengers. We have here a, the major, most major redemptive event is God's son becoming a man and collecting a band of men about him to, in a sense, um, inaugurate God's kingdom and reinstitute Israel. Uh, that's what Jesus was doing, 12 disciples, 12 tribes, sending out 70, representing the 70 nations at Babel. Jesus is reconstituting Israel, so a huge, re huge redemptive event, outpouring of revelation that his ambassadors will write down. So the, our, the short argument for the closure of the canon is we think of redemptive history, which is what Reformed people really emphasize, creation, redemption, creation, fall, redemption, consummation, at these pivotal moments in redemptive history, there's revelation that has been written down. The last great event of redemption was the crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension of his son. So there's going to be an outpouring of revelation with that event and closure. The next big redemptive event is the return of Jesus. So in between Jesus' ascension and his return, we don't expect there to be any more revelation. So, well, there was, you say, well, technically after he ascended, but yeah, it was within the lifetime of those eyewitnesses. Mark, Peter, Paul, uh, Luke, they were all within that time frame of the early church to record what they had seen, what they had heard, conversations they'd had. Luke, we don't read about Luke till somewhere in the book of Acts, but Luke had talked to the eyewitnesses, he had talked to Peter, he had interviewed John, he said, tell me what Jesus said in the boat, tell me what, what he said when he got into the boat, tell me what he... And, and Luke's recording it. He studied these things. So the short answer is, the last great redemptive event occurred in Jesus' life, ministry, death, resurrection, ascension that's been recorded by his representatives. 
there is no more revelation to follow. But you see, so the short answer is not really short, but there's a, there's a theological reason. Uh, you know, and then if you take all of that to the table and you say, what, does it stand to reason that now, the dates are, are missing me, but when was Joseph Smith? 1730s, was it? Or 1830s, thank you, off by 100. 1830s. Would it make sense that we have 1,800 years of history and the world's just humming along, the church is growing, the church is struggling, the church is thriving, there's reformation, there's product, you know, all of this history, and all of a sudden God's like saying, this isn't enough. Now you need three more books. Just that face value is just completely absurd, you know. But see, you know, the Mormons said it, Joseph Smith said that all, he, he asked the Lord, what church should I join? And the Lord said, they're all apostate. He specifically mentioned the Presbyterians. You know, Joseph Smith did not like Presbyterians. Which that's, that's our camp. Those are the Reformed bros. Um, no. So, so it's like all the churches are apostate, and, and you need more revelation. So just at face value, it's just completely ludicrous. But, he, but you know what? Classic cult. He, he needed more revelation to establish his lies. You know, that's what it was. He twisted the, the revelation, but then he added three more to, uh, to bolster his, his falsehood. Elizabeth. Yes. It's just a different Greek word. Yeah. This is the only place this word is actually used in the New Testament. Yeah, there's synonyms. But a lot of the words that Paul was using in this verse have Hebrew, I want to say baggage, but that, make that a good thing. But, you know, Timothy is his pupil, his student in the faith, his son in the faith, and he's using all these, because he talks about Timothy being raised by his grandmother, by his mother, they taught him the sacred writings, and he's just pulling up all these old Hebrew ideas, you know, from school, you know, it's like, uh, it, it'd be kind of like saying, to our kids, you know, make sure you do arithmetic. And they're like, a what? You know, math. But you know, if they grew up back in the day, you know, Laura Ingalls Wilder, and you know, and then arithmetic's like, oh yeah, that's math. So Paul's just taking up those words like arithmetic and he's throwing them in. Timothy's like, you know, Timothy's like, yeah, that's what he's saying. He's, he's just bringing me back to my roots and he's saying, study the word. Put yourself in the word, be immersed in it. So, any other questions? All right, so what I want to do is turn in your bulletins and turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 20. I want to get to the signs of the times, if anything, just to introduce it, but I want to just simply go over 2.4. You see, I put a lot of stuff in the bulletin this day because two reasons. Last Sunday, I was rushed trying to go through this, and I think that wasn't helpful. And I, want, I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but I just want to focus it on its second reason, because premillennials put a lot of stock in these verses. So in your Bibles now, forget your bulletin for a second, Revelation chapter 20, I'm just going to read verses 4 through 6. John says, Then I saw thrones, and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. Also I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection, over such the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. So, what I want to do here, just very briefly, is in premillennial eschatology, they believe, these, these are key verses, so it won't hurt to just kind of go through it real quickly. The first resurrection is a physical resurrection, uh, that occurs before the tribulation. Jesus comes to earth. Well, it's a secret rapture. Uh, 
Believers are raised from their, de- their graves. They go to heaven for seven years. After the tribulation, they return with Jesus and they reign on the earth for a thousand years. So verse five, this is the first resurrection. So we need to ask the question, does the Bible teach two resurrections of believers? Because we have a first one here and in pre thought, the second one is all those who are gonna die in the thousand years, then they will be resurrected at the end of the thousand years. So in pre eschatology, you have two physical bodily resurrections, the first group and the second group. Is that what is being taught here? You see in the bulletin, just the, I did this for as much for my sake. The believer's first resurrection is spiritual, not physical. How do we know that the first resurrection in verse 5 is not a physical bodily resurrection? Well, as we noted in verse 4, he says he saw souls. He didn't see bodies. He saw souls. And the contrast here in, in the third bullet point is between souls and the rest of the dead who are unbelievers. Verse 4, the souls came to life, which does not refer to their physical resurrection, but to their living with Christ in heaven. What Verse 4, he saw those souls seated with, uh, he saw these souls seated on thrones, and to them was given authority to judge. Uh, they'd been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus, for the word of God, and for those who had not worshipped the beast or its image. They reign with Christ for a thousand years. So fourth bullet point, the first resurrection, verse five, is parallel to they came to life in verse four and is not not contrasted with a second resurrection. See, that's very clear here. John is not contrasting a first resurrection with a second resurrection. If you look look at the text, right? That's what's still beautiful about sola scriptura, inspired word, look at the text. He's contrasting a first resurrection and verse six, a second death. So that already tells you Paul's not comparing apples uh, to apples here. And he's not comparing a first resurrection physical and a second physical. He's comparing a spiritual resurrection, verse um, five, with a spiritual death called the second death in verse six. Uh, so I was just looking away here from my notes. The second death is the consignment of the unbelievers who have died to everlasting death and hell at the final judgment. What distinguishes those who partake of the first resurrection is that they are not subject to the second spiritual death. The first resurrection is said to be first because it brings victory over spiritual death. Um, the believer's second resurrection, there is a second resurrection. It is your physical resurrection at the end of time, which will bring victory over physical death when your body rises from the grave. The blessings enjoyed by the saints in heaven now are already the blessed experience of the saints on earth because we have already participated in the first resurrection. We are not liable to the dominion and curse of the second death. A little bit complicated, but I hope that might be helpful. You might need to just go home and read this, read these things too, side by side. But let's just stand back for a second and see the forest for the trees. John has a vision, and he sees the martyrs who have died for their testimony to Jesus as reigning in heaven and seated on thrones. And he sees them as serving as priests, verse 6, to God and reigning with him for a thousand years. And this is beautiful. Go in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 19. Verse six. God said to the children of Israel when he instituted a covenant with them at Mount Sinai that he would make them, quote, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So kingdom, kings, priests, holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. So he said to Israel, you will be a nation of kings and priests. Go to Isaiah chapter 61, verse 6. Isaiah chapter 61, verse 6.
but you shall be called the priests of the Lord, and they shall speak of you as the ministers of our God. You shall eat the wealth of the nations, and in, your, and in their glory you shall boast. So there's the concept explicit, being priests, but implicit, eating the wealth of nations as royalty, as kings, as reigning. One more, go to Zechariah chapter 6. This is a harder one to find. It's right near the end of your Old Testament. Right before Malachi is Zechariah chapter 6 at verse 13. Now this refers to the Messiah. The other ones refer to the people of God. Zechariah 6.13 It is he who shall build the temple of the Lord and shall bear royal honor, and he shall sit and rule on his throne and there shall be a priest on his throne, and the council of peace shall be between them both. So we have in Zechariah's vision a priest king, a priestly king and a kingly priest reigning on the throne. That's the Messiah, that's Jesus, who is not only lion of the tribe of Judah, but also priest, high priest of the Most High God of the order of Melchizedek, so there's this Old Testament um, revelation that Israel, God's people, would be a nation of priests and kings who would participate, Zechariah 6, in the priestly, kingly rule of the Messiah. What's glorious as we now come to the end of Revelation is that John sees in the vision these now deceased and first resurrection raised souls reigning with Christ participating in his kingly and priestly rule. Isn't that amazing? They're sitting on thrones with Christ. You know, we, we have the hallmark thought that we're strumming harps of gold on clouds, uh, but John's revelation is better. We are sitting on thrones. Amazing. Remember the Chronicles of Narnia? Peter, Lucy, Edmund, uh, Susan, uh, they're all on thrones. See, I love the Chronicles of Narnia. It's really C.S. Lewis's commentary on the Bible. It's great. Um, that's what John sees going on. Just to expand this for a second, throughout the book of Revelation, believers who have died are described as being more than conquerors. So here's the, here's the, here's the paradox and the riddle, is that the world will... will kill the Christians, they'll be martyrs, their blood will be in the streets, the Romans would burn Christians and cast, cast their ashes into the River Seine in, in France and, and think that they had defeated, that they had destroyed the church. And yet John says, no, you haven't, they're reigning. You just promoted them. <laughs> That's all you did. You gave them a promotion. Isn't that glorious? And this is the hope of the church. And brothers and sisters, you and I already, though we haven't participated in the first resurrection, as John defines it, it can elsewhere be described as simply regeneration. We who believe in Jesus have already participated in that first resurrection. We've been raised from the deadness of our sins. In the Bible, what does Paul say? Romans chapter 8, we are more than conquerors. John picks up that same image. So we don't need to wait until we die to participate in the kingly, priestly reign of Christ. We already enjoy that here and now. Um, one last thing here, and then we'll, we'll switch gears for a second. So uh, just a couple other big points. Think about this thought. In the premillennial thought, you have a first resurrection separated by a thousand years, and you have a second resurrection of those who died in between. And yet, when you read, for example, 1 Corinthians 15, you see in 1 Corinthians 15 that there is a resurrection of the dead, and then comes the end. In the twinkling of an eye, at the trumpet's last sound. And when you read consistently throughout the rest of Scripture, you see that there is a once-for-all physical resurrection at the end of history, and it's all over at that moment. And so it doesn't fit Scripture to take Revelation 20 and say, no, there's actually two resurrections separated by a thousand years because in 1 Corinthians 15, 42 through 44, and also in John chapter 5, 28 and 29, 
There's no other proof text in the Bible to speak about a resurrection of believers that occurs in the middle of history. All the other texts show the resurrection of believers is at the end of history. And, and at that moment, death is defeated. And that's the key in 1 Corinthians 15. When bodies are raised from the dead, death is defeated. And in 1 Corinthians 15, where, O oh, death, is your sting? In 1 Corinthians 15, when the dead rise, death is defeated, and when death is defeated, it's over. It's over for Satan. So to think of all of the Gentiles who have died being raised, and then death, death is defeated. But then a thousand years where now there's still more people, that theology of the premillennial theology does not fit with all the other texts. And so this is my last caveat before we leave this. Revelation 20 is not a text that we should be afraid of. We should love it and adore it. It is filled with so much encouragement and so much comfort and so much strength. But you must interpret this with the rest of Scripture. If you get your eschatology, your doctrine of the end times, from one chapter in the Bible, basically exclusively, that's problematic. Now, remember my professors, I've said this before, but they would say in seminary, if you're writing a sermon and you see something in that verse that no other commentary says, you're probably wrong, you know? So, you know, if you take all your eschatology from one verse and everything else seems to be saying something different, then your interpretation of this verse is probably wrong. So, just that. All right, let's see here. Well, the kids will be coming up soon, but let's introduce the signs of the times. See, I don't even have any space left, so we're just gonna introduce it. When we speak about the signs of the times, what are we talking about? We're talking about those events, portents, earthquakes, you know, Matthew 24. We don't have time to read Matthew 24. We will read that, Lord willing, in two weeks, but I'm just introducing it now. Uh, but we're thinking about all those things that announce that Jesus Christ is about to return. That's what we're thinking about. Incidentally, when we talk about the signs of the times, that is found in one place in the Bible. It's found in Matthew chapter 16. We'll turn there because uh, you'll see it for yourself. See, the beautiful thing about the doctrine of Scripture is you all get to be Bereans. We all, me too, we study the Word, say prove it. That's a good thing, right? Protestants are like, prove it. You want me to believe it? Prove it. Show me from the Bible. So in Matthew 16, Verse 1, Pharisees and Sadducees came and to test him, they asked him to show them a sign from heaven. He answered them, when it is evening, you say, it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be stormy today, for the sky is red and threatening. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. So he left them and departed. So this is great because we always got to take everything you read and you take everything you hear from me and you go to the Bible and say, is this biblical, right? So um, the only time we think of the signs of the times is right here. This is where, well, not the only time we think of it, but this is where we read it. And they're asking Jesus, prove to us that you're the Messiah. And Jesus says, you are an evil generation. You know that? Oh, right. He's just like what Paul says to Timothy. Jesus rebukes them. He says, I'll give you a sign of the times, sign of Jonah. You go think about that. Well, we know how to read that, right? Jonah, three days in the whale. Three days later, Jonah is risen from the whale. And so that's a sign of Jesus' death and resurrection. But here's what's interesting. They ask for a sign of the times, and the sign Jesus gives them is a sign of his first coming, not his second coming. The sign that he gives them is a sign proving that he is, at this present moment in history, the Messiah who is standing before them. So we want to correct some of our thinking. We tend to think that the signs of the times are the things that are going to happen right before Jesus comes. Like, you know, it's like World War II, Jesus is coming. But in the Bible, the signs of the times are signs that testify to the advent of the Messiah to the presence of his coming. So Jesus Christ is on earth, first time in the flesh, 
and he starts giving them the signs of the times. That's really exciting. He uses the term signs to signify that at that present moment, he the Messiah had come and was inaugurating his kingdom. Here's another example. Listen to what Peter says. Now this is Peter's Pentecost sermon. Acts 2, 22. Men of Israel hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. Peter says to the Jews, God gave you signs of the times, wonders, miraculous things. John the Baptist is in jail, about to be beheaded. And he says to his disciples, did we get it wrong? And he goes to Jesus and he says, Jesus, are you the right guy? In Matthew chapter 10, Jesus gives him signs. The deaf hear, the lame speak, the blind see, lame walk, um, right? Dead are raised, signs of the times. The signs of the times refers to, quote, this is from uh, Cornelius Venema. Those events or portents revealed in the word of God which confirm that the present course of history is moving towards the day of the Lord. See, John was confused, John the Baptist, because he said, his winnowing fork is in his hand. He, the ax is laid at the root of the tree. So he was looking for, he, John was preaching judgment. And he says, when, when the Messiah comes, he's gonna judge. So John's all confused. He says, what about these signs? And Jesus says, oh, there's other signs. The dead are raised. The lame are leaping for joy, the blind are seeing. That's what he told the disciples to tell John, who is sitting in, in jail. Jesus is saying to John's disciples, these signs testify that the kingdom is coming, and yes, judgment that John announced is also coming. Things have begun. Things have been set in motion. See, this is what's exciting, right? This is, I think, why the women were terrified. The resurrection of Jesus announced that the end had begun, that at that pivotal moment, God's redemptive people had stepped into the last battle. You get Chronicles of Narnia, volume six. We have at that moment stepped into the last book. The last chapter has just been opened up. Nations will be gathered in and judgment is approaching us. Our salvation is drawing nearer to us than the day when we first believed. We quickly make haste the coming of the day of our Lord. All these events have been set in motion, and the signs that Jesus speaks about testifying to his first advent testify that we are approaching that, that we have entered into the present course of history is moving towards the day of the Lord. The signs do not exclusively refer to events that will immediately precede Christ's return, but rather they describe events that happen throughout the whole millennium. So when you read Matthew 24, when you read the signs of the times and the destruction of Jerusalem, we're reading signs that describe this period of history from the first coming to the second coming. That's when Jesus starts giving us signs is when he first came. For example, we'll read this next week. Matthew chapter 24 gives us certain signs that are very clearly fulfilled in the fall of Jerusalem. So Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21 are all parallel texts. And they record for us these signs. And when you read these signs, you're like, yes, yeah, some of those happened. Some of those still have to happen. So we're not looking at signs as all happening right before the end or allowing us to somehow pinpoint that he's going to come now. You know, because I believe in World War I, and then I believe if they didn't think it in World War I, they thought it in World War II. They thought, this is it. Jesus is going to come back any moment now. But when we read the signs as beginning in the first coming and concluding, talking about this period of history, then we realize that we can't pinpoint the day. We could have nuclear war, you know, and that is actually not to be an alarmist, that's actually not a far off reality. China's making movements on Taiwan, Russia's making movements to re resurrect the old Soviet Union. We could have full blown nuclear war and a third of the world be decimated and yet Christ could still come in 2,000 years. We can't 
read the signs and pinpoint this is it. Because those signs cover a whole period of history. We'll end with this. Go to Matthew 24. We'll read this, Lord willing, in two weeks. Matthew 24, verse 34. 24, this is the classic text. Even you have the heading, signs of the close of the age. Matthew 24, 34. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. So Jesus gave a whole bunch of signs. And when I read that English verse, it says that those things happened in the lifetime of the disciples. So that is a bit of a can of worms too, but it's kind of a fun one. How do we read that? And there's different ways. I've heard people translate it as this evil generation, so that's any evil generation. But the plain reading of the text is the main reading of the text is the first rule in hermeneutics. The plain reading of the text is Jesus is saying, this generation, he's talking to Peter and Paul, or Paul wasn't there, John, James, they're like, he's talking about us. So these signs are going to do some double duty. That's how we're going to look at that. And some of it will clearly point to the fall of Jerusalem. Some of it will also point to the general course of history, that the end is drawing near, Christ is reigning on his throne, and... Uh, believers with him. So what's exciting is, actually I don't have it in the notes, but the first sign is not one of judgment, but a sign of grace. We're going to look at signs of signs of the present working and triumph of God's grace. And then we're going to look at signs of judgment, but we'll take that up in two weeks. Signs of God's grace is coming up. Let's worship the Lord.